Let me pray for us as we get started. Heavenly Father, we come in need of nourishment and refreshment this morning. We come in need of fresh tastes of your wonderful kindness to us and uh, in need of insight, wisdom for our lives, in need of strength to keep going, in need of hope. We pray that you'd help us to see how Christ is here for us, how he provides for us. And uh, we pray that you'd help us to, to better understand what you call us to as your people this morning as we hear from your work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Well, in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has turned down offers to flee the country and to seek asylum in other countries, and he has insisted instead on staying in the capital and leading his people. Publicly, he speaks with great confidence uh, to his people, telling them that they will prevail in the end. Privately, though, he also has conceded to world leaders that this would probably be the last time that they would see his face because he was recognized in Russia as enemy number one, the guy that everybody's going after. Zelensky's bravery in the face of danger, his decision to not take that lifeboat when it was available to him, it's leadership from another time, it seems. It's the kind of leadership that our grandparents would talk about. The kind of leadership that they saw modeled time and time again in times of war. But this kind of leadership is rare in our day. And that's why his bravery in this instance has come to inspire so many people and so many of us in recent weeks. You see, most of us are heirs of a peace that we never had to fight for. We grew up in a world of comforts and conveniences where so much was available to us that we could spend our whole day in a mall just choosing between good options of which one to buy. That's not the way humans have always lived. It is a luxury that we enjoy because we have both wealth and peace in America. But the abundant conveniences of modern life also spoil us. They train us to see ourselves as a consumer and to spend our days asking, what do I want? We start to feel like our life is our own to do with what we please. And our goal in life tends to become, well, not a very high goal at all. It's not some great cause we're fighting for. It's not the survival of our country or any great vision like that for our life. Our life just becomes about getting through today to make it to tomorrow. And it becomes, hopefully, being able to enjoy ourselves a little bit <sighs> along the way. We just get into a little bit of TV in the evening, good night's rest. That's it. We just want to get through life. And so what we end up living then in our modern world, oftentimes, is a small life. Not small in terms of its importance necessarily, but where our, our vision of our life and what our life could be and should be is so small because we, we lack any real purpose. And our focus is essentially just on ourselves. Now we recognize that this isn't the life that we want to live. We're not happy with this life, but it's also the only life that we've ever known. This is how we've always lived. We hear stories of people who have found that great cause to fight for, that, that cause that they died for, and we admire people like that. But we ourselves are too afraid to lose what we'd, we would need to leave behind to do that ourselves. In today's passage, we'll see that in Christ, we can find a cause worth dying for. We can find a cause that is worthy of the one life that we have, and that Jesus is in the business of transforming ordinary people like us into people of heroic conviction and courage. Paul is now making his way to the city of Jerusalem. 
He is going there knowing full well that serious danger is waiting for him there. But he is going there because he is convinced that Jesus wants him to go. In this, in this passage, Paul provides us with an example of the kind of courageous disciple that you could become by Christ's power. We also, in this passage, get an example of the kind of person we naturally are. In Demetrius, we get a glimpse of the self-centered way we all tend to live as human beings. So what we're going to do today is we're first going to look at how these two men lived and why. And then we'll circle back and take a closer look at Paul's example and ask, how was Paul able to live with such courage as a Christian? The passage starts and ends with Paul's resolve to go to Jerusalem, even though, as I said, suffering is waiting for him. In chapter 19, verses 22 and 23, uh, and 21, sorry, 21 and 22, we see that Paul and the Holy Spirit agree that this is where he needs to go. This is where Paul thinks he needs to go, and this is where the Spirit tells him, yes, you do need to go there. It says, now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to go to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. While Paul is in Asia, while Paul is in the city of Ephesus still, Another man named Demetrius starts this movement against him and against all the Christians in the city. And this movement eventually becomes so large and so angry that a riot ensues. Take a look. Verse 23. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her significance, her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius, and Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the, into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, but the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Now the issue is this. Paul and the Christians have been going around telling people about Jesus. Those people have been coming to faith. And because of this, they have stopped going to the temple of Artemis to worship. Now, those who worshiped Artemis certainly didn't like that this was happening. But those whose livelihoods depended on people and going and worshiping in the temple, well, they saw this as a serious threat to their livelihood. The temple of Artemis was famous. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was much larger than a football field. And it was over 60 feet High. It was about four times the size of the Parthenon. It was the largest building in all of Greece. It was a magnificent building. 
There was also a worship center dedicated to the god Artemis, or in Roman mythology, Diana. Artemis was depicted as a hunter with a bow and arrow. She was a strong figure. And the city took pride in Artemis. They took pride in the fact that their city was the city where great Artemis had her great temple. Now, one of the groups that profited from this temple worship were the silversmiths. Silversmiths made the silver shrines that people would buy and then bring into the temple to perform their worship. Demetrius was probably the leader of the silversmith guild here in Ephesus. And he was pretty concerned about some of these changes he was seeing in the city. He noticed that the stream of worshipers had started to slow because these people were starting to follow Jesus. So he decides he needs to rally the guild against the Christians. He explains that these Christians are a serious threat to business. Not only that, but they're a threat to the glory of great Artemis herself. And with that, a threat to the glory of our great city. They must be stopped, he says. Demetrius's speech ends up inciting a riot. First, the silversmiths start chanting over and over, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Then people nearby hear them doing this chant, and they come to see what's going on. These people also worshiped Artemis, and they were happy to also join in the chant to defend Artemis, their god, right? So everybody's cheering, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Well, then you get a really big crowd, and everybody wants to see what's going on. This crowd becomes a mob. It's totally disorganized, and, but it's able to move its way into this theater where they would often have these big gatherings of people. It could fit thousands of people. All these people are streaming in. They're chanting things. Nobody knows what's really in. Nobody knows, you know, exactly what they're chanting. Uh, there's all these differences of opinion about what we're here for. Some people don't even know what's going on, he says. There's nobody in charge. It's chaos. Some of them are chanting, great as Artemis of the Ephesians, for two hours straight. Can you imagine being in that stadium, right? I mean, you... <laughs> You can imagine somebody chanting somebody's name, like, you know, for like a minute, how that would be like, whoa, that's so cool. They're chanting, but it's like 120 minutes of just chanting greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. I mean, it was, it was just chaos, right? It was a crazy scene. You can imagine how this would whip up people's emotions. It was dangerous, right? It was out of control. Now, at some point, people in the theater see two Christians standing outside, Gaius and Aristarchus, and they drag them into the theater. Paul sees this happen, and he wants to go in and save them, even though he'd be risking his life. But his friends insist, no, you can't do that, Paul. This mob is not going to listen to reason, even if you try. If you go in there, they're just going to kill you. And for what? It's too dangerous. You wouldn't even help them. The situation is out of your control. And what we see is it's only when the city's highest ranking official, the town clerk, enters this, the theater and warns the people that they are about to be charged with rioting, that they finally quiet down and go home. Verses 35 to 41. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So town clerk makes a few helpful points that compel the crowd. First, he says, everybody knows Artemis is great. Her reputation is just fine, don't worry. Second, these Christians haven't done anything illegal, so this response is extreme and unjustified. And third, if you still think that they broke the law, taken to court. Let justice be served. Mob justice is not justice. Oh, also number four, just to let you know, you're about to be arrested for rioting, so you better stop. 
And so the crowd finally disperses. Demetrius has spearheaded an unjust movement against the church. And he's done this not because he was especially an evil person. He's done this because he is an ordinary fallen human being, because he is a sinner. Demetrius's focus in these verses was on preventing loss. He didn't want his city to lose status. He didn't want his God to lose status. He didn't want his professional career to lose status or his guild to lose status. He also doesn't want to lose income. He doesn't want to lose the comforts that money can buy. He doesn't want to lose the status quo. He liked it. He wanted it to continue. Before Paul was there, he was comfortable. Business was great. Artemis was being honored. He didn't want that to change. So he wasn't going to take these changes sitting down. He was going to fight for what he and his community deserved. He wasn't just going to take this loss. He was going to work to stop it. And in the end, it's only when the town clerk comes and threatens a different kind of loss, being charged with a crime and imprisoned, that Demetrius, out of his own self-interest, backs down. It's easy to live and think like Demetrius in our everyday life, where we can live this way where we're focused on stopping losses, where we're focused on protecting what we have in our lives. You can do this with your money. You can go to great lengths to try to save money to protect and keep whatever money you have. You can do this with your time as you get impatient with those people who get in your way or as you ignore people who need your help because you say you just don't have the time. We can be so self-protective with what we have, so focused on keeping what's ours. And if someone threatens to take these things from us, oh, we get it up in arms, right? We don't turn the other cheek. We slap them back. You cut me off, you're getting a five-second hum. You know, it's not just Demetrius who gets up in arms when people are threatening what's his. That's human nature. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to protect yourself or to stand up for your rights. Sometimes this is necessary. But we must never let self-protection or self-preservation become the causes that rule our lives. Because that's idolatry. That's putting ourself on the throne. That is fighting for the kingdom of self. Sure, this is how most people live in our world, but it is not how Jesus teaches us to live. If we look instead at the example that Paul sets for us in chapter 20, we see that Paul is oriented outward, that he is showing love for God and for others, which leads him to make sacrifices for those people. In verses 1 to 6, we see how Paul spent his time encouraging others. It says, after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed to Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So Peter the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Wherever Paul went, he would encourage the believers. Because Paul's focus was not on all the new sights and sounds of the new city where he was. It was not where he was going next. It was not on his immediate needs. His focus was on the needs of other people around him. So he spent his days, he chooses to spend his days encouraging his brothers and sisters in the faith, serving other people. In verses 7 to 12, we see Paul spending a great deal of time fellowshipping with these people, with his brothers and sisters in Christ, and teaching them so that they could better follow Christ. He's serving them in a different way. We also see him show mercy to a boy in great need of it. 
Let's take a look. Verses 7 to 12, chapter 20. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him. And taking him in his arms, he said, do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive, and were not a little comfort. So it's the night before Paul is going to leave Troas, the night before a big journey. So what does he do before he leaves? He gets people together for a night of fellowship. When they arrive, he gives a very long teaching session. I mean, hour after hour after hour. Like, I know the sermon can feel like it goes on for hours, but he was actually teaching for many hours, right? It gets to midnight. He is still teaching. And this boy, based on the way he's described, he would have been elementary school, middle school age. He falls asleep. He was trying his best to stay awake and listen. He falls asleep. And because he was perched on a windowsill, he plummets three stories to the ground. And he dies. People are shrieking. Paul heads down the stairs. And by God's power, he miraculously brings this boy back from the dead. The boy gets up. People are overjoyed. People are thanking God. You can only imagine what it'd be like if somebody fell out this window, died this morning. And then somebody prayed and they were resurrected from the dead. I mean, think about how shocking that would be. Well, everybody wants to just hang out all night and celebrate and praise God together, right? So they, they get together the rest of the night. They hang out. They worship God. They fellowship. And then by the time sunrise comes, Paul says, okay, I got to leave. And then with zero sleep, he heads off at sunrise to this next city. What does that show us about Paul? shows us that Paul is more than happy to give of his time and energy to serve others. Even when this means that the day ahead of him is going to be much harder as a result. It's a sacrifice to not sleep at all before a long journey. But it's a sacrifice that Paul is willing to make for the people that he loves. Sleep or no sleep, Paul was going to see this mission through. He was dead set on making it to Jerusalem, ideally before Pentecost started. Look at verses 13 to 16. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day, we touched at Samos. And, after, and the day after that, we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So Luke doesn't tell us in this particular passage why Paul is heading to Jerusalem, but what we come to learn later is that this is a mission to deliver financial support to the church in Jerusalem. Paul has been going around to various Gentile churches on his journeys and collecting donations for the church in Jerusalem. At this point, he's now got a large sum of money with him, uh, and he knows he's got to get this to them. They need the money. They have been uh, dealing with persecution from the Jews in Jerusalem, serious persecution. This money is going to help them out. It is, a, it is a love gift from these Gentiles, and it's been entrusted to him, and he knows he's got to deliver this aid to them. So instead of going to Ephesus, which is, again, where he, he really wants to spend time, he loves Ephesus. Instead of going back to Ephesus and encouraging them, he says, all right, I only have time to ask 
the elders of the church in Ephesus to come and meet me in Miletus. And so he says, hey, guys, can you, you know, can you send to them and have them come and just we can have a little uh, teaching time before I have to leave. And so the, uh, the Ephesian elders come to Miletus here and he delivers this speech to them. Next week, we're going to be looking at uh, the details of the speech, but I want to just point you out, uh, point out the beginning of the speech here because it actually shows us something important. It shows us at this point what is really on Paul's heart. What is it that's animating him? What is it that he, he thinks is coming to him in Jerusalem? It gives us some important details. So let's take a look, verses 17 to 25. It says, now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me during, that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. These verses show us what's on Paul's heart. They let us see what's driving him to make sacrifices, to take risks, he says in verse 24, it is the commission that he had received from the Lord, this commission to testify to the gospel of God's grace in Christ. The gospel is the amazing news that God has provided for us by meeting our deepest and most fundamental need. When we were in no place to be able to provide for ourselves, for when we were guilty of countless sins and deserving of hell, the God who loves us came to us in the person of Jesus to pay off the debt of our sin in full. Then he rose again from the dead and is now reigning as the Lord of all creation. That good news is the news that had transformed Paul, the persecutor, to Paul, the preacher. That news was so life-changing that it transformed how Paul saw his whole life. Now he couldn't stop serving Jesus. He had to keep testifying to the gospel. So that sinners could find salvation, so that saints could be encouraged, so that the body of Christ could grow and flourish to the glory of Jesus. Because Jesus had commissioned him to do this very thing. This is what Jesus had clearly told him he wanted him to do. So to him, this was everything. This is what he was here for. This is what mattered to him most of all. I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Well, since my life is not about serving my life, my life is not about sustaining my life. My life is not about savoring my life. My life is about Jesus. My life belongs to Jesus. And my goal in life is to stay faithful to Jesus and to finish the race that he has set out for me. Now that is a heart that has been transformed by the gospel. It's not just talk. Paul means every word. Paul wasn't spending his days fighting to keep what was his, fighting to get more of what he wanted. He spent his days laying down his life for others. That's why he still insists on going to Jerusalem, even though the Holy Spirit has told him that imprisonment and affliction are going to come to him now. If this costs him his freedom, so be it. 
If this costs him his life, so be it. I see in verse 25 that this is exactly what he thinks is going to happen. Maybe not in Jerusalem, but it's coming to him. And he was going to die for Jesus. So that these elders were not going to see his face again. And yet, still he chooses to go to Jerusalem to accomplish what God had willed for him. Just as his Lord Jesus had insisted on going to Jerusalem to do what God had willed him to do knowing full well that it would cost him his life. What mattered most to Paul was not protecting his own life. What mattered was that this is where his master was telling him to go. So for Paul, that settled it. He was going to Jerusalem. That's what his master wanted. And he was going to do it no matter the consequences. Paul was the kind of fearless, faithful, loving Christian we all want to be. Now, how, if Paul was born living like Demetrius, did he become such a committed and courageous follower of Jesus? It came as three things shifted in Paul's life as he began to follow Christ. First, his purpose shifted. Demetrius had no grand purpose for his life. He wasn't striving for any particular he was just living his life. That's how life often feels in the day to day. You wake up, you get going. Your goal is just to make it through to the evening. Your goal this week is to get through this week. Your goal this year is to get through this year. You've got a lot of stuff coming. In the absence of a great purpose for our lives, life becomes something we are trying to endure. There's no grand vision or purpose for many of us. And when we do locate a purpose that inspires us, it usually ends up being some vision of a better future for ourselves, right? You might feel lethargic, but then if you think, oh, but if I do this, then I'm going to have this great career. Okay, well, then I have lots of energy and I have these goals in life. But our goals are still self-centered. We're like Demetrius. We might be fighting, but we're still fighting. Just whether we're fighting to keep what we have or fighting to get more of what we want, we're fighting for ourselves. But Paul's purpose had shifted. Paul had found a great purpose for his life. Paul had found a cause to live for, a cause worth dying for. So his focus was no longer on himself. It was on Christ and on this greater purpose. Paul was free then from the self-focus that captivates our minds. He'd rather make disciples than make money. His focus was on saving others, not saving himself. He wanted his Lord to be glorified, not to get glory for himself. He wanted to see the gospel go to the nations. He wanted to see people find salvation in Jesus so they could escape the horrors of hell and find the, the joy that comes from knowing the God who created them. Paul had been set free from the tyranny of self-focus, and he had found a greater good to give himself to. His purpose had shifted. Second, his identity had shifted. Demetrius found his identity in his worldly circumstances. He was, above all, a silversmith and a member of his community. So he lived and thought like a silversmith and like a member of his community. When his vocation and city were threatened, he was filled with energy and he fought to defend them in the way that he saw fit. These Christians weren't going to take away his livelihood and trash his city without a fight. But Paul identified, above all, as a servant of Jesus. He says in verses 18 to 21 that when he lived among these Ephesians, he spent his days serving the Lord with all humility. He lived among them as Jesus' servant. He was seeking to do Jesus' will. His master's will was that he should be a servant of others. So that's what he did in Ephesus, even when it was costly and dangerous. So Paul's courageous decision to go to Jerusalem now, it's not coming out of nowhere. This grand act where he was doing his master's will in the face of huge risks came from a man who was risking his life or risking for Jesus in smaller ways every day. And his master didn't just command him to take these risks. He also, he also inspired him to take these risks. Paul knew his Lord had risked it all. 
His Lord had given up his very life to serve him. Now it was his turn to serve his Lord, even if that meant laying down his life for Jesus. His purpose had shifted. His identity had shifted. And lastly, his confidence had shifted. Demetrius' confidence was in himself. As he saw it, his future was in his own hands. And in the face of this serious threat, it was up to him to put a stop to it. Everything depended on Demetrius. Because of this, then, you know, he was anxious about whether he'd be able to stop this movement, whether his, his livelihood would be threatened, whether it would work to stop these Christians, whether people would start coming back to the temple. He was anxious. But he had to do something. Paul, on the other hand, does not appear anxious about his future. Even though there is a much more serious threat that's coming his way. Paul isn't running from this threat, nor is he rallying people against this threat. He is calm and resolute. And he can respond like, these, this, like this to these threats because his confidence has shifted. His confidence is now in Jesus. He is trusting Jesus to provide for him. He knows Jesus can be trusted. He knows Jesus takes care of his servants. And that Jesus said, as we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness in this life, he takes care of the rest of it. Paul so believes this, that he's ready to stake everything on it. In Jesus, he trusts. Jesus will provide for him. And this confidence frees Paul from the need to secure his own future. Because he knows Jesus is going to provide for him all his days, he knows he can follow Jesus all his days without having to hold anything back to secure his own life. And he knows that whenever Jesus says his days are finished, Jesus is going to provide for him in death too. His Lord is the risen king. His Lord is the God who gives life to the dead. Paul knows this. That's why he prayed for that boy to be raised from the dead. That's why Jesus could resurrect him. Paul is confident of Jesus' resurrection power because he's seen it firsthand. And he is more than convinced that Jesus is going to provide for his needs so long as he's walking this earth. And so he trusts Jesus' promise that those who believe in him will never truly die. And he, he goes in faith in you know, obedience to Christ to do what Jesus is calling him to do, even in the face of moral danger. To him, he's thinking, well, Jesus has it. I don't need to worry about it. There's no use worrying. I couldn't change my future anyway. There's no need to worry. Jesus is going to take care of me. The Lord is going to provide. He provides his servants with their daily bread today, tomorrow, and forever. I mean, so, guys, if we really believe that, if we're really able to shift our, our whole confidence to Jesus, Think about how freeing that would be. We'd feel so free to live for something greater than ourselves, to live for Jesus, even without fear, because we know our, our future is secure, that he will look after us. We'd find a freedom to live for Christ, to die for Christ. Because then we'd know, hey, no matter what happens, even if I'm killed, my Lord is going to protect me. And my Lord is going to provide for me in this life and in the next. In Christ, we find a new purpose, a new identity, and a new confidence, which takes away our fear of the future and sets us free to risk everything for Jesus. Is Jesus worthy of your one life on this earth? Is Jesus worth the risk? Is it worth the cost to follow him? He is worth all these things. Will you and I then set aside other important causes to pursue him above all? Will you and I renounce our trust in ourselves and entrust ourselves entirely to him? 
Will we pick up our cross and follow him? For the glory of Christ, we must. By the power of Christ, we can. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would help us to follow Jesus faithfully, to trust him completely, to find ourselves in him, to let you define who we are, to find the purposes and what's worthy of our life, to outline how we are to live and why. We pray that in every way, the Spirit would work to transform us, to give us the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, so that we might live more and more the life of Christ, imitating him more and more truly in our everyday life. We pray that you take away the fear and anxiety that keeps us from obedience, that you would take away the, the selfishness, the selfish impulses that we have, that you would, you would limit those so that we can give ourselves for others and for you in sacrificial love. We pray that you would make us faithful to the task that you've given to us. You've commissioned us to go and make disciples of all nations. And we pray you give us the strength and the faith that we need to do that faithfully. Let us be used by you. Would you work through us to do wonderful and amazing things? Not for our sake, for the sake of our glory, but for yours. Because we know that this is our good to live for you, and to enjoy you forever. So we pray that you make that happen in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.